Let's put together and test out this 555 PWM control kit, which was sent to me by Simple Electronics, and he has a video playlist with nine videos testing this circuit on the breadboard and developing it, and then doing a KiCad schematic and PCB design. So I'll link to that playlist below. And let's take a look at the schematic while I put this kit together, and then we'll test it out. This is your basic A-stable multi-vibrator configuration. So power comes in on this screw terminal here. I'll be running mine at 5 volts for convenience, but it was designed with 12 volt capability in mind. Then there's a power supply decoupling ceramic and electrolytic capacitor, a 10 nano capacitor on the control voltage to ground to help filter any noise and help stabilize the frequency because we don't want to impact the frequency of oscillation with this control voltage pin. Then there's the A-stable configuration, and if we ignore the two diodes for now and just think of this 50k pot as a fixed resistor going from this capacitor up to this resistor. That's your typical resistor from VCC to discharge, another resistor from discharge to threshold and trigger, then the timing capacitor to ground. So that's this configuration here. So the output here is controlling the gate of a FET. So this screw terminal connection here is going to be either open or pulled to ground. And the other screw terminal on the output is always at VCC. So the high period and low period of the output on the 555 is controlled by this capacitor charging through RA plus RB, connecting the capacitor to VCC. And when the capacitor is discharging, that occurs through pin 7, which is an open collector transistor. So when the transistor is on, pin 7 goes straight to ground. So the capacitor discharges just through RB. So the charge period is based on two resistors. Discharge is only based on the one resistor. And here's the actual equations. So the charge time is 0 0.693 times those two resistors added together times capacitance. The discharge time is just 0.693 times RB times the capacitance. And then those two time periods added together equals the overall period of the oscillator. And one over period is the frequency of the oscillator. So with this circuit, with these diodes and a potentiometer, when the capacitor is charging, this D2 is reverse biased because we have a positive voltage here and ground on the anode. So this whole section here is out of circuit, including this portion of the potentiometer. So while charging, the capacitor charges through this section of the potentiometer through this forward biased diode and a 1K resistor. When the capacitor charges high enough, and the discharge pin is connected to ground when this transistor turns on, bringing pin 7 to ground. Now we have ground here and a higher voltage here, so this diode is forward biased, and now this path is in circuit. D1 is reverse biased, so this is out of circuit with this half of the potentiometer, and this 1K resistor is acting just as a load across VCC and ground through this discharge transistor, so it's not part of the discharge timing. So by moving this pot, we're changing the charge time and the discharge time, which allows us to change the duty cycle, and the frequency should stay relatively stable instead of changing all over the place as we change the timing values. Looking at those equations for the charge and discharge time, if we just look at this empirically with a few calculations, let's start out assuming this potentiometer wiper is right in the middle, so we have 25k resistance on one half, 25k resistance on the other half. So the duty cycle will be around 50% because we are charging up through this path with 25k plus 1k, and we are discharging through this path with just 25k. So the charge time and the discharge time will give us a period, and one over that period says our frequency will be about 283 hertz. Now let's say we move the potentiometer most of the way toward this D1. So we're going to have 
5k of resistance here and 45k of resistance over here. So now we're going to charge up with 5k plus 1k and we're going to discharge with 45k. Looking at that equation with those two different potentiometer resistances, our final frequency is still 283 hertz, just like this 25k, 25k pot, 283 hertz. But now it takes longer to discharge the capacitor with this 45k resistance compared to when it was only 25k of discharge resistance. Now if we move the pot mostly toward D2, so let's say we have 5k of resistance here, 45k toward D1, now the charge time is through 45k plus 1k, the discharge time is through 5k, and now looking at these equations, again we have 283 hertz frequency, but now it takes longer for the capacitor to charge through the 45k pot, than it did when it was only a 5k pot or a 25k pot. So we're keeping the frequency relatively constant, but we're changing the ratio of on time to off time or duty cycle. And so the output frequency on pin 3 of the 555 at varying duty and relatively fixed frequency, it will turn on this gate of this FET, which brings one of the output terminals to ground or leaves it floating. So if we hook up an LED that we want to dim or a motor that we want to control the speed of, it'll be left floating or connected to ground at a certain duty cycle and the LED can be brightness adjusted and the motor can be speed controlled. So let's take a look at that circuit in action. And I noticed my frequency was a couple of hundred hertz higher than what I calculate. So I'm not sure if that's component tolerances. And my frequency was drifting around a bit, as we will see. But we can see the overall principle in action. There's the board all assembled. I'll give it 5 volts and ground on the screw terminals. And these are the outputs where one is tied to VCC and the other is the FET switching to ground. And there's the potentiometer with its 0.1 inch header adapter because the pads were too close together for this size pot. So as we turn the pot, we can observe on the scope what the duty cycle and frequency are, and we're going to look at an LED and a small DC motor being PWM controlled. I have an LED hooked up to the PWM output now. I'm running it at 5 volts because that's what was convenient for me. So I can change the duty, and as I get a longer low period, the LED is going to be brighter because one side is fixed at VCC and the other side gets PWM'd between VCC and ground. So as I increase the duty, I'm bringing both sides of the LED to VCC for a longer period and the brightness goes down. I can get this up to 97.2% on time and I can go all the way to 0% duty also, the frequency right now at maximum duty, it's around 565 or 68 hertz. As I change the duty, right now it's 520 hertz at about 56% duty. And when I go down to maybe 12 or 13% duty, it's 546 or 49 hertz, which isn't too much of a big deal. It's not a huge variance. And for the sake of controlling an LED brightness, that's fine. Now if I take away the LED, now I have a little hobby motor and a diode with cathode to the fixed VCC and anode to the FET output to help get rid of any big spikes. Even though the PWM waveform is now going to be noisy, by changing the duty I can change the speed of the motor. So here the output of the PWM is high most of the time and low a little amount of time. So when it's low, that's when the motor is on and it can only go slowly when it's barely turned on. Now when I change it so that the low period gets bigger, it's low for a longer time so the motor can spin faster. Well now I have a nice little PCB I can get if I need to just do a quick PWM experiment with minimal hassle. And it's a good little circuit to have around just to evaluate and try to understand how certain circuit topologies like this duty cycle control actually work. Thanks Simple Electronics for sending me this kit. 
Don't forget to go check his playlist and other videos on his channel. I'll see you on the next video.